All right, five o'clock. Um, joining us, uh, Tim Schroeder from the Pac-12. He's on fire. He's talking about uh, a good presentation on holding. Uh, let's see. Tomorrow we have Scott Novak, NFL referee, White Hat, 10 a.m. Next week, Tuesday, uh, Dr. John Cooper, referee from Las Cruces, will be giving a class on loose ball. Thursday, 10 a.m. on the Sierra with the coaches officials webinar at 10 a.m. through Dana's uh, Zoom account. And then next Friday, NFL referee at 5 p.m. On the 9th is Sarah Thomas, NFL line of scrimmage official. So tonight is uh, appreciate football. And I was like two years old then. <laughs> um, so you started uh, fishing and uh, that's high school officials association and on to the Kansas Jayhawk Conference, uh, just like probably everybody, everyone's pipeline out of Colorado. Uh, he did some indoor football in the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference in 2009, was hired in the Mountain West until 2011. I'm assuming you got hired there as um. Yes, that's correct. And then you yep. some some bowl game. Right. Yep. So, Tim, uh, my little boy. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. Yeah, we, we appreciate you uh, coming on, spending some time with us. And and I heard this uh, holding presentation uh, last year at. Our Mac clinic, and and I think that it's some really good stuff that that you put together here, and, and you presented. Um, whether it's your presentation, I understand. I understand that you, you told us last year you you still a lot of the stuff for your presentation. Absolutely, like all of us do. And, Absolutely, you know, try to make yeah. it our own. Throw away the stuff that don't work for us, and use the stuff that does work for us. So I think this this is great, and uh, I really wanted uh, the high school officials to. To hear this same class that that I heard, so uh, appreciate can, it. Can, go ahead. Okay, so um, yeah, so we'll we'll, we'll give you the, the the screen. Go ahead and share your screen. Um, okay. We'll give everybody a chance to ask questions um, either through the chat or uh, whenever you have a chance, you could break for for some questions, and it'll be up to you. Sounds good. First of all, can everybody hear me okay? Anybody that's having questions, it's me breaking up. Any problem? It was Dennis that was breaking up. We hear you. Yeah. Come. Okay, great, great. And, and guys, I really appreciate the chance just to share some thoughts with you. As Dennis said, um, this is a presentation some, that some other guys have put together, most notably uh, Carl Cheffers, who's an NFL referee, and then a couple of guys from the Pac-12, Frank Miller and, and Steve uh, Strimling. So, um, I would say that regardless of the level that we're working, um, this is a kind of a unique way to uh, think about holding, and uh, it's kind of a unique way to communicate holding, um, because a lot of times we find out that um, we think that there's holding on every play. Well, maybe, maybe not. My take is that there's probably grabbing on every play. And what we want to do here is, is kind of, first of all, think about that verbiage. Holding in football is a foul. Okay? So while there's grabbing on every play, there may not necessarily be a hold that indicates flag should be thrown. Fair enough? So that's the first thing that I would say here. And I'm going to try to get this... Cleaned it up here. That was quick. Well, I guess we won't. Um, 
that we're not necessarily holding on every play, but grabbing on every play. And what we want to do is look at number one, some indicators which might lead us to make better decisions about holding. First of all, in terms of where do we look, what types of you what know, kinds of body movements and positions do we uh, do give us indicators that there somebody is susceptible to a foul. And then secondly, we want to look at the severity of the action and how much does it really uh, impact the play. So in football, the, the foul is holding, preventing somebody from carrying out their assignment. So don't get caught up in the specific NFHS or NCAA or NFL rule books, but there's very specific verbiage that defines holding and what's a foul. So an offensive player cannot use his hands, arms, or legs to hook, lock, clamp, grasp, grasp and circle, or hold an effort to uh, restrain an opponent. Same is pretty much true for the defensive player, except that they can hold or restrain the runner or someone who is uh, simulating being a ball carrier. The unique thing that we'll find when it comes to holding is these two bullet points at the bottom of the screen. That offensive holding arises out of necessity. We're beaten in some way. I'm not fast enough. I'm not strong enough. I took the wrong angle. Um, you know, I, I'm too far extended. Defensive holding, generally speaking, is something that's taught and coached. Okay? So if we can look at some of those indicators, give us an idea of where to start, first of all, in looking for problems. So the pros say the same kinds of things, using the hands, arms to materially restrict a defender's path. So everybody pretty clear on what holding is, okay? That also includes, you know, grabbing or tackling, any kind of hook, jerk, or twist that really creates an advantage for the person holding and puts the opponent at a disadvantage. So what are some of the indicators? Well, first of all, some guys might say the back out of whack, meaning the guy's backside should be between, if I'm the blocker, my backside should be between my opponent and the ball carrier. So that would suggest that I'm pretty good in pretty good blocking position. And if you look at any of these scenarios, these any potential indicators, and then sit and watch football players practice, you'll see exactly what we're talking about, right? We want good, good position between ourselves and a back and the defender. Breaking the color barrier simply means if I have the red team on offense and the white team on defense, uh, if, if I'm looking at it from the referee's position, right, I should see a big C in red. That indicates the blockers are all in good position. If I start to see white showing through, that's an indicator that one of my blockers has gotten beaten. Does that make sense, guys? And the same is true on the opposite side of the field. If I'm an umpire or a back judge or somebody looking at it from a defensive perspective, defense is in white. Boy, if I see those red colors coming through uh, or separating a little bit, that might be an indicator that somebody is in bad position and may have to hold. And the same is true with the bad body behavior. All right? If you look and uh, watch someone who is blocking in good position, much like a a chiropractor where their feet and their hips and their shoulders and their hands are in line with their defender, it's pretty hard for us to have a foul for offensive holding. If I am dry blocking somebody straight ahead, even if I have my hands outside of the frame a little bit, it's probably not because of the hold that I'm beating my defender. Okay. There's a unique situation that we um, defenders use oftentimes called a rip move, which simply means they try to get an arm up underneath the armpit of the offensive player, kind of lift him off the ground or at least spin him around. And part of the rule of thinking is that if the defender puts him in a situation where he has hooked arms with his opponent, with the offensive player, we can't necessarily blame the blocker for that action. So what we're saying is that once the defender gets to the point where he is even with this offensive player using that rip technique, he's got to drop or disengage that rip to continue his move towards the quarterback. Any questions so far? This certainly doesn't cover all of the potential indicators, but it's what we'll look at here in some of the film, give you a pretty good idea how the action sets up. And we're not talking about anticipating the flags that we're going to throw. We want to anticipate the decisions we're going to have to make regarding the action between the players. 
Okay. So sometimes there's situations like I just mentioned, if my position is really good as an offensive locker, we might allow a little bit of grabbing outside of the frame, a little bit of hold of a jersey or hand placement around the back, something like that, provided it's below the shoulders and generally within the frame of the defender. And when it comes to holding, it's kind of hard to hold with your feet and legs. So we're generally looking at the hands and the arms from the top down because that's what we have to grab or hold with. Okay, again, this is a little bit repetitive, but the blocker's back should be between the ball carrier um, and the blocker, excuse me, and the defender. So some people say crack to the back. So if his back's out of whack, is this at the point of attack? Right? Is that block the crucial one that might spring the running back? And the color barrier is when opposing colors break through the offensive line. Again, it's just an indicator where it might have potential trouble. All right, a couple of other things here. We've talked about the rip move, but moving players versus stationary players. Think about this. Even in our high school games, we probably have the offensive linemen are a little bit bigger, maybe a little bit slower, and it's probably in a stance at the snap, and we may have them going against a little bit faster defensive ends or linebackers who are blitzing. So there's the potential risk there. If you see a linebacker walking up um, in between the gaps, we might want to pay particular attention to that because he's moving, he's got a head of steam versus the offensive player standing still. And the same is true with our big guys out in space. When the big guys get out in space, right, if they, if they start out going left, they're going to keep going left until they fall over or you know, run into something heavy, right? So it's really hard for a big guy to get out in space particularly against a defensive back or a smaller, more agile player, and then all of a sudden change direction or salvage a block if he's juked by the defensive player. So again, it's just another thing to be aware of out in space. Questions so far? Okay, when we talk about the severity of the contact, and we'll finish this up here real quick and get into some film, we're kind of looking at a level of, of five different uh, severities, if you will. So, you know, when it comes to nothing, not up, we're probably talking about that drive block where the offensive player is just beating up the defender, but maybe his hands are outside of the frame um, or outside around the shoulder or arm. Doesn't really have any impact. The defender's feet don't slip or slide. His shoulders don't buckle or dip. He just maybe has bad hand placement, but no impact on the play. The mano a mano versus, you know, hand fighting, it's probably much more um, guys on the perimeter that are both moving. If we're both running at an angle, one of us is trying to get position to block, the other is trying to fight through. There might be a little tugging, pulling, and so on. But as long as it's not somebody that's really taken from his feet um, or thrown to the ground or severely restricted, would we want to have a foul in that situation, particularly if you look at number three, right? If these two guys are out on the perimeter and they're both going in the same direction that they want to go, we don't really have a foul. Guys are just happy to be moving both in that direction, especially if that defender's in, excuse me, the blocker's in position where he's got his back between the blocker and the ball carrier, particularly if we see those good colors um, where they should be. And it sounds kind of simplistic, but if you think about it, as you progress and things get a little bit faster, um, or guys move in double teams and, and schemes get a little bit more complicated, we've got to process, at least I do, using big information first, right? Big bright colors, is a guy upright, um, or is he his shoulders going low? You know, is he on the move or is he stationary? So when we would want to have a foul is when there's significant restriction because of the hold. And that means the defender is spun around and has to actually do a 360 to get away from the blocker. Um, he slows down meaningfully. Uh, as you can see, you see his feet buckle or his shoulders dip because he's being restricted in some way. And I would advise just to try to be careful. It's easy to see some of those indicators without actually seeing the crime being committed. 
but don't get caught up in that. All right, make sure that we're seeing the action that is actually a foul um, that has a meaningful restriction on the play. Now, obviously, the worst would be a takedown um, or a tackle or used in the same fashion, a throwdown. Um, there might be a few situations where we would pass on a takedown. Perhaps if um, it's a sweep wide right and um, there's a takedown maybe on the back side on the left. You might consider taking that, you know, use your best judgment with your, um, your association there. I think a takedown is a takedown as a foul because that gets guys pretty hot under the collar. If they're getting thrown down in the middle of every uh, open space where everybody can see it and they start saying, hey, gee, well, that's pretty. Um, what um, what are you guys going to call if you're not going to throw uh, flags for takedowns? Fair enough. Okay. Categories they're just used to help uh, quantify the action a little bit. It's not as big uh, a deal to me. Sometimes your paperwork or your systems uh, for recording files would uh, require a particular code, but um, a grab and release is, is okay, right? A defender's got to continue to fight. And if he fights and breaks through the action, the restriction, then it's not a hole. If he doesn't fight and he's just dancing along with the blocker, well, probably not a foul there either. Okay? So a hook and turn might be an actual grab of a jersey, but he might have a finger on a shoulder pad or an elbow or whatever it is. A jerk and restrict is usually something that happens real quick right at the point of attack or out in space. And the don't see though, we're seeing this a little bit more and more, some of the, the blockers actually run around behind the defenders and, and grab around the waist to kind of slingshot themselves in, into action and then the takedown we mentioned, okay? So if we're having to think too much about it, we probably don't have a foul. So for example, if we have a scrimmage kick or free kick play and it results in a touchback or a kick out of bounds, we probably don't want to have a foul um, unless there's a takedown in the middle of the field. Uh, same is true with the fair catch or situations where the defender is actually held right into making the tackle, right? So that's not the same as if a nose tackle um, is held and makes a pursuit four yards downfield where they all run into the ball carrier and make the tackle. That would certainly be a foul. But if a defender um, submarines at the line of scrimmage and is taken down in the process of running to the ball carrier, runs into the ball carrier and makes the tackle, that's where we would probably hold off because he's making a two yard loss or something like that, even though he may be restricted, all right? And the other thing is some kind of element of time or yardage. Is it really in the, uh, area of the uh, the ball carrier, or has the ball carrier already left the scene? Right. It's easy to get fooled on action when the ball carrier um, has already run through the uh, the hole. Okay. So there are a couple of uh, NFL philosophies as we just talked about. If the action occurs away from the point of attack, um, if it results in a touchback. Um, if it's part of a double team block, we've got a couple of lens here where um, there's action that initiates as a double team block, but then the defender splits the action and gets pulled to the ground. So that's where we'd certainly want to have um, a foul for, for offensive holding. And do you guys understand why we're talking about maybe looking away from double team blocks regarding offensive holes? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, the point is this, is that the offense is giving up two blockers to block one. So they're putting themselves at somewhat of a disadvantage. So we would want that action to be particularly egregious before we really have a hold uh, on a double team situation like that. Okay. So make the hold find you, right? As I mentioned, let's make sure that um, we see all of the action, not just a weird slip, fall, twist, or otherwise. So we have to know what we're talking about um, in terms of our primary responsibilities and areas of coverage. So as it says there, keys uh, start the engine of the car, but once you start the car, what do you do with the keys, right? You move on to other parts of the car. 
So focus on your area of responsibility, not just the start of the play. So that leads into progressions, which we'll take a look at here in the film. And um, that last bullet point says, if it's a foul at the start or when the, the restriction occurs, you know, it's still a foul three seconds later. Um, better to be sure that we've got a foul and um, not throw too early. It's hard to reel that fish back in sometimes. So I, uh, I think that we've got the pretty consistent philosophy I'm holding. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot of this verbiage before. So grasping a shirt and a pulling a jersey doesn't always mean a, a hole. Was the defender really controlled? Don't get caught up on whether or not the hands are inside or outside of the frame, simply because um, for this reason. Um, number one, it's harder to see that action if my hands are inside the frame of somebody else, right? Secondly, it's harder to control somebody don't have the same leverage if my hands are inside. However, it can be done. So we can't get caught up in, in um, talking to players and coaches about simply having hands inside the frame, right? We've got to be using in terms in ter uh, words in terms of uh, grab and restriction or a pull at the point of attack, um, not just where the hands were on the body. So I mentioned this briefly on, on the takedowns. We really want to pass on, uh, on a takedown, right? They're placed at a disadvantage regardless of where it is on the field. Um, you know, just after uh, or as the ball carrier is being or tackled, perhaps. And uh, like I say, you know, these are retaliations and guys get pretty hot if they're getting thrown around once in a while. So, okay. The perimeter versus the interior line when it comes to offensive holding, here's the way I think of it. If, if we've got, um, you know, two 300-pounders going head-to-head, -head, it takes a little bit more than just a jersey tug, especially in close line play. If I might have an offensive guard and I've got a center to my left and a tackle to my right, we're moving forward as one, my goodness, it's going to take quite a bit uh, of restriction um, and poor hand placement and grabbing and pulling in that scenario versus if I'm out on the perimeter and I'm leaning around the corner for a very fast running back who's up at full speed, all I've got to do there is give a quick tug on the defender's jersey as the running back is going by and he springs it for a big run. Does that make sense, guys? The fact that, you know, sometimes we want to have huge pulls and restrictions that's usually right at the point of attack with our bigger guys in close line play. Doesn't have to be that severe out on the perimeter to make a difference. Any other questions before we go on to uh, looking at some film? I have a question. Uh, yeah. But what are you going to tell that defender who's dancing? What, what, do, you, what do you tell him? Yeah, I say you got but I said, look, and, and, and my feeling is the same with holding as anybody else, any other situation. We're just telling the facts, right? I said, yeah, I saw he had his hands out there, but you were running right along with him as if you're happy to be there. All right, keep fighting and make an effort to break through that hold. Now, that's not pleasant for him to hear, but that's the fact, right? He's got to keep fighting. Right, and you can even be proactive in doing that. Right, you see somebody in the corner, or whatever, who, who gives the international line being held signal, right? Throws his arms up, and what does he just told you when he does that? He told you he gave up on the play. So it's not it's not our job to bail them out for giving up on the play. They got to keep competing throughout the down. That's a satisfactory answer, I know, in having to give that to a player, but that's that's what we've got, right? If it doesn't rise to the level of a significant restriction uh, at the point of attack because you're not competing, you know, let's find somebody else who is. So, like I said, you can be proactive with that and just go ahead and, and in this case, if that was, I see what's going on, I know it, you got to keep fighting through this um, or... A simple one is, or a frequent one is, 
Look, guys, I saw that he's got a restriction on you just as you're breaking through, right as the ball's being thrown. Okay? Guys, once the ball's thrown, I've got to turn and look downfield. Or once the ball's thrown, it really doesn't have a significant impact on the play, and we don't want to have a foul there. Is that consistent with your philosophies, guys? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Jim, before you go on, can you just sure? Can you explain one thing just a little bit more? Can you refer to an offensive lineman having bad feet? Sure, sure. Um, food for thought, guys. Um, if you have the time to do it before a game, um, if you get out and, and build a little rapport with players, and I look for two things. One is the the the, word, the weakest link which is usually an offensive lineman that just isn't very athletic. And you can watch him when they're warming up. He's got really heavy feet, and, you know, he doesn't turn very well or get out and run very well. And the other guy I'm looking for is the biggest jerk, because I know I've got to have him, uh, you know, try to make some play with him in some fashion if I can. So uh, um, bad feet to your, your point, Dennis, would be just that. The guy who can take a step getting out of his stance, but he can't run much after that, right? Take a good enough directional step to get an angle on a defender, or he can get there initially, but forgets to keep moving his feet once he's engaged. And so once that defender tries to turn and run from him, the only choice he's got is to grab on, because his feet aren't any good. Does that answer your question, Dave? Thank you. Yeah. And I'm going to go through some of these pretty quickly. If it gets to be too quick, um, just let me know. But we'll try to get through some indicators here. What we're looking at here is uh, can you see my cursor moving, guys, at the top of the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So we're looking here. This is the one I just mentioned out in space. Um, where guys are running at pretty much full speed and we have a ball carrier coming out onto the periphery and all he needs is a little bit of a step on this defender. All right, so now I will say this, let's not get hung up too much on, on if you say, well, this is definitely a foul or it isn't or not. But if you can see what we're talking about here, first of all, he's not in good position, is he? Because all of a sudden, is, is he between the defender and the ball carrier? No. He's not, right? So he's either got to get fast in a hurry, or he's going to have to cheat at some point. And here in this case, the defender's closing faster than he's making up ground. And so he's going to take a chance that he can pretend he just bumped into him accidentally and let the ball carrier spring around. So... But I would think that this would be significant enough because he's not putting his hand in his chest. He's not getting two hands there to make a block. He's hooking him as he comes by, right? Then he gives up the, uh, the international, I didn't hold anybody's signal, right? So there's that situation. You can probably see it a mile away, right? I guess you guys, have, you guys are gonna have a lot more bodies to watch. But my point being, you can see it out in space and anticipate the decision you're going to have to make. And here in this case, block, block, uh-oh, he didn't do it. What's he going to do? Is he going to let him run by? Nope. So he's just uh, cheating at the last second, right? You've heard that saying before, they beat, they cheat, huh? Here on the corner again, the same play. What I said, excuse me. This one we have down here at the bottom. Now, if we're looking at these two players, right, we're out in space here. The blocker at the bottom of the field is in decent position. In and of itself, yeah, he's got bad hands, but they're both kind of doing that chicken fighting. Can you see him kind of pushing, pulling at each other? Right? The defender looks like he's trying to keep outside containment, maybe, and the blocker's trying to uh, get position on him. So he's not necessarily um, in bad position, not terrible position, but certainly what happens when the defender gets on an even 
yard line with the running back. Right? He's got to have an equal chance to get to the ball carrier, right? So it isn't that he had bad hands at this point. It's what he does with them at this point, right? So there we go. And if we look at this from another angle, here's another indicator for us as we come out to this uh, to the side zone here, I think. Can I move that window somehow? Right, there you go. So if we look at the defender's shoulders, right, you can see he's starting to hunker down. His body movement says, I'm trying to break away from the block. But the indicator would suggest otherwise, right? He's a good enough athlete. He's not going to just try and reach out with one hand. So we could see him stop, try to move, can't move, restriction, and we should have a flag there for offensive holding. Okay, uh, on this punt play, I'm going to fast forward it a little bit here. Look at the coach's angle. We talked a little bit about the foul and its impact on the play. Generally speaking, if we're at the line of scrimmage on a punt play, um, we'd like to have a pretty significant restriction here at this point. Um, certainly have somebody spun around or taken to the ground if we have a decent punt. And why is that? Well, it's because it's 40 yards away from where the return is. How much significance does it really have unless it is a real spin or a tackle on the, on the uh, pursuit player? Which is, in fact, what we have here. If you can see here on the line of scrimmage, right about the hash. Okay. So here it is. He's in good position, good position, but decides to hang on to him the whole way down. Okay. And it's pretty hard to justify passing on a guy getting tackled in the open field on a punt play. Fair enough. Does that kind of illustrate the severity that we're trying to see in some of these? Yeah, that's that takedown you were describing earlier. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you walk up to that uh, USC player and say, yeah, he took you down, but I didn't think it was a big enough takedown. But it's kind of hard to justify that. On this, we will see a double team that starts on a kickoff. And this is kind of the action we'd like to see to have the uh, foul for offensive holding on a double team. We'll actually have to go to the end zone view or sideline view. I believe it's our center and guard here. So these two players at about the 45, they come together initially. The double team. But the player on the left obviously loses his balance, isn't really paying attention or, you know, out of position. So the player on the inside decides to pull him down. So the cover, cover player has certainly done his job in attacking the team. And um, that's, that's a foul that we should have a flag for. Right here. And that's one of those ones that we would look at kind of go, well, that's a double team. Probably not going to have much trouble. But the indicator would be all of a sudden we see a fair amount of blue jerseys, right? The colors are bad. And people don't usually go down to the ground like that. We should see bodies flailing uh, here in that scenario and have a flag down for it. It must be, I'm going to skip through this one. Oh, no, excuse me. I'm just skipping my notes. So this is something that should show up to the uh, to the umpire, maybe the referee, right? It's the, the right part here. And he starts out in pretty good position. And there's an example of bad feet. What does he do? 
he leans, lunges without moving his feet, anticipating the defender to come right into him. And the defender takes off around the corner, will come around to the other angle. So it's our uh, guard right here. So bad feet, he lunges, right? He's got no option other than to try and hold or trip. And while on, on, on one hand, it looks like the defender's, you know, making his way through, the reality is he's taking a step away from him here, right? We can see that defender about right there, you know, unless it's a new dance move. That's the shoulder being pulled down because he's being held. I got to ask. I got to ask a question about five sure. mechanics. Um, yeah. Is, is, is it seems like that was is that going to be transitioning to the referee or is that still the umpires? Even though it's like two and a half yards past back from the line of scrimmage. There, I, I would think um, that this, would, in my opinion, has been a while. I'm sorry since I've worked five man, but I, I'm thinking that the referee's going to have to pick this up. Um, let's see. Right. If we look at the other colors here in this situation, it's the really the only threat. Now I know that means you've got one, two, three, four engagements to worry about, but we should be able to to clear this one um, and clear this one just because of proximity and get a peek at this. And that's an awful lot to see at once, right? And we as umpires have to get better at kind of looking through the doorway, but. Yeah, I would, I would certainly like us to be able to see this from the backside as a referee. You might ask Scott something like that um, tomorrow. But, you know, see, it, it just happens to be he's blocked out, which means we've got to move as umpires to get a little bit better look. And uh, referees, you know, this is really just a running play, right? And where are we going? We've got to go to the point of attack on the running play, and that's right there. That would be my my thinking in watching this. Did anybody agree or disagree? It's an awful lot to see in five man mechanics. Here's a better example of a big guy out in space. I believe it's this backside tackle here. It's going to come around to the top side. Oh, long tackle. So it's the right tackle that's going to swoop around. And it's not the greatest example of a big guy in space. Um, but my guess is, you know, that defensive end is a little bit more athletic than that tackle is. And he doesn't have much choice. Once he gets around the corner, he doesn't make it around the corner far enough to to have that end pinned in like he's coached. So he's going to have to do something with it. Yeah, Knight, excuse me, let me jump in. Yeah. In five looks like he, uh, it, it's not a natural act. He's like has to backpedal because he's being held. Is that what you're describing as? You know? Yeah. If we go around, I think we can, oops, I'm going to get to the other angle and I think we can see it from the end zone better. So over here. So it's just that it's right there, right? But at some point, I would think that if he's not being held, he's going to turn and run as opposed to continue to backpedal, which I think is what we see there. Would you agree? Exactly. That's, that's what I yeah. was looking for. It's just, Whether or not it's so huge. Unnatural. Right. Yeah, you're exactly right. Again, there's that indicator, right? The indicator's great right here. Ball carrier, we got two defenders between, or uh, blockers between him and the defender. But then as he bounces outside, now the defender has position. Yeah, and enough of a restriction there to, uh, to warrant the flag.
Looking for it, see here. Well, I think this is a pretty easy one. It's a right tackle, right? They should all be this easy. Pause on an easy one. I'm simply beaten. I decide to pull him to the ground. Any other questions or things you guys would like to see? Anybody want to jump in? I'm loving it. Let's see. This is a tight end, I believe, down here at the bottom. Hey, guys, just unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Yeah, so we're here. All right, so again, with all these blocks, the guys are in pretty good position um, to set up the blocks. It's just that when uh, the ball carrier gets there, they forget to let go. Right. So, and I think we'd agree that's, you know, it's not really huge and thrown to the ground, but it's right where the ball carrier is, right? So, if you go back and look at this even more and how this sets up in a trips setup, look at this whole wall of red right here. Everybody's in pretty good shape. So we just got to scan that action and look for the one that's likely to be the most, be the most threat. Probably not here on the backside because the play is running here. He's got the ball carriers here already, right? So this next threat might be right in here, these two blocks. And then as the ball carrier makes his way out to outside the hash, would be uh, moving towards this block as the potential threats. Does that make sense how to kind of process that through the progression? Now I know that's an awful lot to look for as a wing official. All right, you've got three, four engagements here. Yeah, a crew of four or even a crew of five is just yeah. You got this. a lot of bodies. You got a lot of bodies to take a look at. Let's see. This is out on the periphery again. Now, this is, that's one of those situations, the guy might be able just to chip him right there and push him past the action. But, uh, you know, he gets a hold of that inside shoulder and arm and pulls him down. So, what are we looking at here as a league official, right? So, we got pretty good bodies here, right? We should be able to clear the big colors and big bodies with good angles. This is problematic, right? So I don't know as a referee if you would be coming off this tackle tight end, right? Because the ball carrier is out here by himself. Unless he falls on his, you know, front stripper and drops the ball, you know, no need to watch him. So here's the biggest suspect player here. Let's see, well, it's the right guard. Nope. So left tackle here. And here's something that you might just see early on in the game. You can almost see it from this film here. The size of this guy 
and the size of this guy and the apparent uh, difference in athleticism, right? I mean, he's just beaten from the get-go. So, um, and I don't know how you would want to process this from a sideman mechanic standpoint. You got a lot of backing up into the, ref the referee's face, right? And uh, you've got some receivers going out here as a wing, don't you? Yeah, plus we're only in the first quarter, 650 left. Yeah. Um, you got to set the standard at some point of what you're going to call the rest of the game. So yeah. I, I think that's where this one comes in. Yeah. So a tough one, a tough one to get in five man mechanics just because of the, all that's going on. And whether or not that's huge, but I would think that um, if we look at it, let's go to the next angle. How we're going to process this. Right? I mean, uh, obviously you're from the backside over there, referees. But um, here we are, pretty good colors, right? Making this nice little, except for right here. Pretty good angles on everybody. And so, boy, still here. So when we talk about colors separating or colors in bad positions, that's what we're talking about. Oh my goodness, why is this big purple jersey in my face? That would lead us to come off these other good blocks and look at that action there. Is that how you guys process it? Because I found as an umpire, when I've got four or five or six guys I've got to watch, I've got to watch based upon the big body parts first. Right, and that, right. that's when you're talking about breaking the ball. How yeah. The color comes through. Yeah. So this is just another indication of, you know, guys on the move. Bad hand placement. You see this right guard come around. In good position, good position, but then he hangs on. Right? Now, if... Well, I'm not going to go down that path. I'm trying to think of an idea where we might pass on a hole like that, but... Not in that scenario. So here's one of those situations wherever you are watching uh, from, we've got to recognize that we've got bodies in motion, right? We get two guys coming around. We should see two guys in motion in some fashion. Now, it takes me a little bit to process that and get over to the point of attack. But don't be afraid of being slow and processing what you see once you get there. Does that make sense? So right now, there's nothing really wrong with that action. But now we should be able to see that. So I should have a flag here. You guys want to look at anything else besides the hold? Do you have anything on like, uh, you know, high lows and... Um... Sure, we can get there real quick. I'll take as long as you guys want here, so don't bother me at all. Let's see. Certainly, we had a chop. Here's the see what we have for a clip here. At first glance, he looked like he kind of fell. I don't think that was a high level intentional. Well, no, no. 
he just has it as, as a clip. Okay, so here's something to think about. Um, this is the way I do it when I'm looking at, at stretch plays, meaning it's going outside one direction or the other. Right? In this case, it's going up to the – starting out to the left. We see the, the offensive line kind of all shift that way. On the back side, if the guys' their shoulders are upright, if they're running, it's hard to have a low block, right, a clip or a chop because part of that has to be below the waist, right? So here in general, we should be okay except for any really bad holes because the guys are kind of upright and running at least to start. But then we'll see, now his shoulders start to dip, that's when it should start to get our attention from an umpire standpoint, right? This guy's running upright, running upright, this guy's going down, and we gotta stay with that. So, right, anything from behind, uh, below the calf, or excuse me, below the knee, um, is a clip in, don't split hairs, all right? You might be able to look at this frame by frame and say, gee, it got him, you know, outside or whatever, but, uh, or above the knee, but it's not split hairs there as a clip. So as a as an well, umpire, some chops here, yeah. Go ahead. Um, you know what uh, what uh, what philosophy, philosophy should we follow when you know you have you know like a, a a center and a guard trying you know they they go the high low but you know like the guard like misses completely and sure. you know like the the guy that they're trying to block you know ends up like making the tackle. Are you going to get that? No, no, right. I mean. You know, unless it's a significant true like lure where one guy engages um, or initiates, meaning confronts him, meaning like gives him the head fake, the hands, the whole bit to, to again garner his attention and then he's hit low, we really don't have a foul, right? Uh, is, the rule, is the rule different in high school for you? Is the lure still part of the, the rule? No. <laughs> yeah. So I think we're really going to want to have to have um, contact, generally speaking. So That's a perfect example of having a patient flag, isn't it? That example right there. What you're timing. Talking about. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys are seeing more and more of it, too, where, again, this kind of zone blocking where he wants to come here, he wants to come here, and so on. Um, but what we're finding a lot of times is that this guy wants to get out, and this, the defender engages him as the tackle is blocking low. And in that situation, if the guard is trying to get out, or the center, or someone's trying to get out, and he's actually confronted or engaged by the defender, we would want to hold off on having this as a chop block because the defender's putting himself in that position. Now, that's a tough one. Let's go to the end zone. So, right, these two guys are going to try and come out here somewhere, right? But he's got nothing to do, the guard. So is he really trying to confront him? Gee, I don't think so. I mean, they, they, they contact each other, sure. Yeah, I think that's a, that's exactly the question right there. That play right yeah, there, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, golly, um, I've had them graded both ways. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> there's certainly there's certainly low contact by the tackle, right? The argument is whether or not the guard is actually trying to confront the defender, and I would argue that he's not. Did the R throw on that? I see a flag yeah. come. Yes. So, but with but with eight men, we can have a <laughs> free looking at that tackle in the quarterback. So, I mean, I would certainly support this in a high school game. 
But to me, this guy didn't look like he's putting his hands up in any way to initiate a block. He's kind of looking to, to, to protect himself a little bit because, look, he even runs himself out of the play, he's not even really participating. He screws up his assignment. So, but yeah, I could see how that's supported as a chop, and I would support that here in high school for sure. See if we have any better examples. Hey guys, as you all know, we try to keep our webinars to an hour. Uh, yep. Feel free to ask questions now, please, while we're finishing up these last couple of clips. Yeah, whatever I can answer for you guys. That's a lot simpler there at the top of the screen with the, I think, the tackle and tight end, your tackle and guard. Somebody messes up an assignment. They're both, uh, you know, both are engaging the defender there, one high and one low. <clears throat> I have some better chops in here. Do you stand, do you stand erect or do you prefer the super um, I prefer to stand up. Uh, my supervisor prefers that I bend over because they believe it looks more athletic, but you can see more better standing up. So. The point is that you know it doesn't really matter. I will half crouch a lot of the time, um, just as long as I can see as much as possible at the snap, the center and the two guards in the ball. And uh, if I can get an angle on potential defenders too, that I will try to do right at the snap, just to make it easier. So uh, sometimes that's looking through legs or around legs. Um, it just really, that doesn't matter quite so much anymore, I don't believe. Other than the fact, I think that they like to uh, see guys crouching a little bit more in our conference. Does that answer your question? Kind of clears mud. Yeah, I'm not really an umpire, but I'm just, yeah. uh, I've heard that question asked, and everybody's got their own, uh, whatever's comfortable for you, basically, is what I'm hearing. Yeah, right. Exactly. Let's see. Fifty nine and nine must be in the backfield. As a as a B, mm -hmm. that short pass over the middle, kind of right at your yeah. feet, uh, mm -hmm. the wide receiver or tight ends diving for it. I'm yeah. always looking for the U for help. Um, you know, almost that yeah. play right there, but a little closer to your feet. Are you willing sure, to help sure. the deeps with uh, with that catch no catch? Yeah, absolutely. That's our expectation, and I think what we want to try to do is as an umpire is to pick up the trajectory of the ball and that gives us an indication of uh, how quickly we have to turn and look and whether or not we're going to be much help um, on that pass if it's a 30 40 yard pay, play and you can see a big looping pass come out chances are we're not going to be much help and chances are i'm not going to turn as quickly but in this case we want to turn pretty quickly for that very reason Right, and the only thing we're really going to probably help with on a trajectory like that is catch no catch. If it's a little bit higher trajectory, and we're not likely to rule on the catch itself, then we might want to look for targeting or other personal fouls around the ball carrier and uh, uh, around the, the vicinity of the ball. Does that make sense? So it's not just turning for pass plays, but turning to make ourselves useful. But it's usually to see whether or not the catch was made. Thank you. 
I was trying to figure out, anybody see a chop on that play? I didn't see one. Looks like Gardens. Sackle, maybe. Center. Garden Center. I mean, by rule, that's a foul, right? There's no definition in the rule book as to far how severe that uh, contact has to be. Yeah. Um, so for safety's sake, yeah, we'd want to stay on that. It's here. And I don't know how they decided on that one. The center judge obviously decided it was a chop. Yeah, I think that go, goes back to the very first question I asked you right there again. Yeah. Um, the one guy was protecting himself. Right. i got to be honest. I, I think I would pass on this like Frank did. Just like he put his arm out there to protect himself a little bit. I mean, I, I don't see any real contact being initiated by the center, right? Are they, they, yeah, they're touching. Um, but it's not in any way putting the defender at risk or really engaging with him. Anybody agree or disagree? Am I seeing this funny? No, I agree uh, with you. I agree also. Yeah. I mean, it can be scary as crap. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see that as, as a foul there. Of course, I'm a guy who missed three on one play, so hmm. take that for what it's worth. There's a chop on this one. Um, before, before we end, Everyone on time? Yeah. Before we end the webinar, can you explain um, how you would talk to a coach? Um, no call for a um, offensive player, like a running back, running by a defender, a defender in, in um, the offensive line. Sure, I am. Um, I didn't quite understand didn't quite understand any of that, but what I would say is that um, I'm not the uh, real good, um, I'm not real quick-witted, and some guys just have that, you know, the gift of gab, so I found that it's best just to be honest um, with what you see, right, and just report the facts, um, and you got to try to report the facts the same to players as same to coaches, um, and so if it's like on that uh, last chop, um, that I said I would pass on that. I said, Coach, yeah, they touched each other, but the center didn't make any significant contact enough to warrant a flag. Or in, in, you know, that's not demonstrative enough to be a chop because he just touched the defender and didn't really confront him forcefully. Or, um, Coach, yeah, I saw the running back get snagged a little bit as he was coming out into his route, but I didn't feel that at the line of scrimmage it slowed him up enough. Or, yeah, coach, I saw that um, the defender had the, talk, the tackle beaten, but when that restriction became significant, the ball was already gone. Or, coach, you know what? I probably should have had that one back. Or, coach, you know what? I missed it. I got caught up with the other action over here, whatever that was. Thank you. Yeah, I know that's it, it hurts sometimes, right? Because we want to, you know, we don't want to be one upped by the coach. Um, but I, the, the last time I remember being a smart aleck with a coach, it, it just didn't play well in the moment. 
Well, I put it this way. It played well in the first half and the second half. He didn't think it was very fun. So better off just being honest and saying, here's what I saw. Right. The downside is you got to see it. Right. Or, or yeah, if you know it's not your responsibility, you can't say, well, I'm not my call. Well, you got to say, you know what, coach? Um, I think that was behind me. I'm going to go talk to the covering official. I'm going to talk to your, you know, back judge, side judge, whatever it is. Uh, right? Because we got to be, be uh, trying not to, to get in that habit of saying, well, it's, it's not my call. And guys, I'm more than happy to, to answer any more questions, and, uh, email, text, or whatever. Dennis, if you want to put my contact information out uh, to anybody, I'm happy to do that anytime. So uh, I'll be Slow with uh, five man mechanics, um, but um, we can figure it out pretty easily, probably. Well, we recorded this, it'll be out for the rest of the guys who in our Great. group and other groups if they want to access it. So, uh, I really, really appreciate your time, Tim. No, any, anytime, guys. Thanks so much, and good luck. Uh, stay healthy. This was great, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome, guys. Take care. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. All right, uh, don't forget tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. We'll have Scott Novak talking game day. Cool.